So there are numerous goals of, of political violence, not surprisingly. Um, these range from demands for state action on a particular issue. Uh, when you think about protests that turn violent, uh, for example, over, over wages or, or whatever policy they might want to change. Um, they could be demands uh, to stop state action on a particular issue. Uh, the Animal Liberation Front, for example, has used violence to stop the state from uh, either condoning or uh, actively funding um, tests on animals. Um, it can be used to demand uh, much broader changes, for example, multiple policies or, or um, you know, changes across the political, broader political spectrum, for example, the violent overthrow of a government. Um, or it can be used to demand systemic change, domestic or even international. Think about anarchist movements or communist movements. The difference between um, this and this is we're talking about different governments, different leaders, but not a, a, a change in regimes. Here we're talking about um, a, a complete regime change. So going from democracy and capitalism to communism, for example, or anarchism. Uh, so these have been um, many of the reasons that people have engaged in political violence. Um, one very important form of political violence um, is the demand for domestic systemic change, and this is known as revolution. Revolution can be defined as public seizure of the state in order to overturn the existing government and regime. There are numerous cases of violent revolutions, from the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, um, to the more recent cases of Iran uh, several decades ago, Sudan uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, when the Sudan Liberation Movement and the justice and equality movement actually revolted um, and uh, ended up having a separate uh, state uh, in South Sudan. So interestingly, many revolutions of late have actually been nonviolent. And given this trend, we'll challenge the ideas of revolution a little bit today um, by looking at a couple of cases, the cases of South Africa and Poland, deliberately using nonviolent revolutions because we've seen so many of these uh, so recently. But all revolutions do involve some degree of public participation. Uh, versus coups, for example, which are really elite affairs. Um, though, uh, this is a little bit problematic because it's really unclear what the threshold is. Um, uh, at how many people do you need to call it public participation and to call it a revolution versus an elite-led coup? Um, it, it involves um, taking over the state. It involves removing the old regime and fundamentally reshaping the political, social, and economic institutions in a given state. This is what we mean by regime change, changing the rules of the game completely. Um, now, again, revolutions don't have to necessitate violence if the former regime is ready to back down. Although, historically, this was quite rare. Usually they would fight because they have all these entrenched interests. They've, um, their ideologies uh, might propel them to fight. Um, they're simply, their fear for their lives or their fortunes, if they lose power, um, uh, would propel them to fight. Uh, you could probably argue that thanks to new international norms, in particular democratic legitimacy, we've seen more of these nonviolent revolutions today uh, than ever before. Uh, these can be international in scope. Revolutions can be international in scope, taking uh, place over multiple states or, more usually, um, with other sta state actors involved. In other words, uh, a, a state um, supporting a revolution in a particular country, um, as the United States did frequently in the 20th century. So some expl explanations for revolutions uh, include relative deprivation. Relative deprivation is this gap between how we live and how we expect to live. And this can come as a result of major economic change, uh, a divide between rich and poor, um, simply promises of political elites that, that, that can't be um, or are not um, implemented. So relative deprivation is an important term to understand. Um, there could be systemic conditions, um, specific sets of conditions um, that, that might lead to revolutions. For example, Skokpol points out to uh, the, the effects of international competition, which can demonstrate what a particular state's weaknesses and then prompt these states to try to reform. As these states try to reform, uh, this can hurt entrenched interests. It can be seen as an opening by the public, um, and it can lead to a full-fledged revolution uh, of the sort that we talked about in the Soviet Union a couple of classes ago. This is exactly the same sort of thing that happened. Um, they, they were forced to compete. They, they, they were struggling in their competition. They tried to reform their system so that they'd be more competitive, um, this uh, hurt lots of people. Gorbachev went up against lots of um, entrenched interests. 
um, and they tried to hit back. And so instead of giving in, he, uh, he actually pushed the reforms to go further and faster. Um, this was seen as an opening by the public, so the public got involved um, and, and became st strong advocates of reform, uh, pushing the reforms in different directions than Gorbachev would have liked to. And bam, you had a revolution of sorts. Um, and finally, the last point here, um, and there are many explanations that you could probably come up with, but these are typical. And, these, and this is sort of the, um, the charismatic answer, which is leader, you, you've got particular leadership qualities. For example, a rebel leader who can gain a following. Um, and this might sound simple and it might sound sort of like a, a cop-out, but this is frequently what makes or breaks a revolution, having the charismatic leadership that can galvanize a public um, because revolutions involve the public. So I'm going to uh, start by looking at the case of Central Europe and then I'll talk about the case of South Africa um, just to explain this a little bit. Um, in Central Europe, the people in Central Europe fought communism from the start. They had partisans, they were crushed, um, and then there was a long period of opposition that was in decline, but occasionally it would show its face. Um, in particular, uh, in, 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 the Czechoslova in Czechoslovakia, um, in Hungary, in Poland. So here I want to start off with uh, the role of ideas, this ideational argument. And now we're not so much talking about political violence as we're talking about revolution. Um, so an ideational explanation for why you had the revolution in, in Eastern Europe and across the post-communist world, now post-communist, then communist, um, would, would be uh, linked to the Helsinki Accords of 1975. The Helsinki Accords, basically what they did, and, and there is a, there's a long list of things that they did. Um, and in fact, human rights weren't a particularly important aspect um, from the perspective of those signing on to these. Um, they were mostly about military weapons. But they did include um, a basket of human rights um, promises. And what these did when these various communist leaders signed on to them is they created expectations in the population. And again, these expectations were in part based on relative deprivation. Um, people felt like now they could look at what the Helsinki Accords um, that their leaders had signed on to pledged to give the people, which was all these various aspects of democracy and human rights. And then they looked at what they really had, and they didn't have these things. Um, and so this created expectations um, that the state should ful fulfill. Um, this was also an institutional um, explanation in, in some ways because the Helsinki Accords then created these various Helsinki committees, a monitoring body that would actually ensure that the Helsinki Accords, that the human rights um, aspects of the Helsinki Accords were actually being followed through on. So here you've got both ideational and institutional aspects. Um, and this led to ideas among oppositionists and gradually further below into mainstream society. So we could talk initially about a smattering of individual dissidents, um, and then it eventually erupts into, um, into, into much broader organizations. So going from largely lead organizations, um, and I could name them, but they probably don't mean much to you, CORE in Poland, for example, Robcho, um, Charter 68 in Czechoslovakia, um, but, but then the wider public at some point. And so um, that at some point we can talk about in Poland, which was the first case where you had a massive movement against communism, and is therefore a very important case, um, back in 1980 and 1981 with the rise of uh, Solidarity, Solidarność. This was a workers' movement that was really prompted by economic concerns, price increases, wage issues. But intellectuals from some of these elite, organ uh, elite by elite I don't mean politically, I mean elite opposition organizations, so very small organizations, these intellectuals, um, from CORE, which I mentioned a couple minutes ago, actually came to be advisors to the movement. Um, and they had a lot of influence both before and during the Solidarity Movement. And so the message and the tactics quickly spread around the country. Um, and economic issues became mixed with political issues. So what they were doing is they were bridging. Um, you had this bridge where the free labor unions... Um, had a, a series of demands that were really rooted in economics, but CORE and these intellectuals based in the human rights movement helped mold them. So, yeah, you, you, can, you, you have these economic demands for wage increases, but you're not going to get them unless you have freedom of assembly, free speech, so that you can make these demands. And the size of this movement eventually forced the government to listen. Um, and, well, there, there are a lot of details involved here. 
Um, but essentially what you have, and here's Lech Wałęsa um, uh, making a speech during a strike in the early 1980s, is you had uh, this, this huge movement which eventually um, forced the government into a negotiated transition. So a couple of key features, uh, oh, let me see, sorry, no, no, a couple of key features of the Polish Revolution are relative deprivation, you had price hikes that, hikes that were key each time you had a revolt, and there were several revolts before Solidarity came about. Um, you have this leadership, this um, charismatic leadership under this guy Lech Wałęsa, who would go on to become president of Poland, um, and really actually lose his charismatic leadership. Oh, that's another long story. Um, and then you have a, a variety of systemic conditions. In particular, the Soviet Union in 1988 uh, was no longer a protector of Central Europe's communist parties. They said they wouldn't um, interfere. So a key, this, these were all key features of the East European revolutions, um, in addition to the fact that you had contagion. Uh, in other words, people saw what happened in Poland and they modeled that. And they said, hey, if it could happen in Poland, it can happen in our communist country, in Hungary, in, um, in Bulgaria, in Romania, wherever it may be. And took place slightly differently in each of these cases. So another case of revolution that I want to go through just to uh, put these ideas in your mind um, is the case of South Africa. Here, again, we can, we can start with um, two aspects, ideational and institutional. And the reason I'm not touching on uh, the, the third aspect um, in terms of uh, individual motivations um, is, is that you can find these in, in all these cases. So people who would join these movements um, out, of, out of pride, out of nationalism, out of uh, a desire to get something like key spots in the new government, um, better income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm focusing here on ideational and institutional just to um, help elaborate on these because they're a little bit more... Uh, uh, mystifying, perhaps. So think about what was going on in South Africa. In South Africa, um, throughout the 1960s, 70s, 80s, you had decolonization everywhere around Africa, pretty much. Um, and in South Africa, you found repression. So it was an outlier. This created expectations of independence, expectations of equality. Everywhere in Africa, this is happening around the world, really, Asia, uh, Latin America, well, especially Asia and Africa, um, and, and you weren't getting this in South Africa. These ideas led to the Black Power Movement, uh, eventually to a mass democratic movement, but also they led, the, the, to, they led to the creation, ultimately, of the African National Congress, which would be the largest, um, the ANC, which would be the largest opposition body in South Africa. It's a political party. Um, and they actually institutionalized some of these demands, um, but let me let me go back to the institutional aspect. So we have the ideas, um, but also the systemic conditions, uh, which created uh, the, the the high poverty, the violence, which created um, demand for a a political opposition. And here, this was actually a group that actually did use violence. Um, they were forced into using violence by the early 1960s. Uh, but let me start um, up here. Um, they created this Freedom Charter. And the Freedom Charter was essentially a constitution um, for uh, uh, this political party, the ANC. Uh, so it reads like this, little pieces. We, the people of South Africa, declare for all of our country and the world to know uh, that South Africa belongs to all those who live in it. Um, authority must be based on the will of the people. And now I'm just paraphrasing. Our country will never be prosperous or free until all people live in brotherhood. Um, so it's, it's very inclusive. Um, but it also sets out, you know, it's found uh, th th there's a disrespect for the government, quote, founded on injustice and equality. It sets out expectations. Um, so these ideas of what they will do if the ANC takes power. Um, and also this institution. This is, uh, this is a constitution of sorts for the party. Um, so, again, another way of understanding ideational and institutional context. So... Um, this all sounds revolutionary, but the problem was that the movement really lacked a revolutionary strength compared to the white uh, repressive government. Um, ultimately, uh, they, they would pick up strength, and, and uh, by the 1970s and 1980s, they became much stronger. Um, in the 1960s, they actually created Mkontoe Sizwe, which is where we can start talking about political violence. Why did people get involved in political in, in Mkontoe Sizwe, which was the military wing of the ANC? that engaged in about 130 acts of sabotage in the country. 
Um, there are about ten or twenty thousand people. It's hard to find the numbers, but about ten or twenty thousand people who actually got into MK. And this is a, a clear case of not only revolution but also political violence. And you could talk about the ideational reasons they got in um, for the same uh, the same ideational reasons we just talked about. Um, institutional reasons, uh, that they were locked out of the government. They had no way um, to negotiate with the government. The only way to negotiate was with their weapons. So we had in Contaway Seasway, um, we had a group called Civics, which were essentially neighborhood organizations that were organized for very concrete things like public services, clotheslines. Um, but then they blended with the political agenda because the local community councils were controlled by the apartheid regime. So they realized, hey, we need to we need to control these ourselves if we're ever going to get what we want. And finally, a final pillar of, of the uh, revolution was the unions. The unions, they were focused initially on workers' issues, but then they also blended into broader political issues. We'll never get the shop floor issues that we, uh, we want resolved unless we have a political um, turnover. Uh, so together, these three groups essentially made vast areas of South Africa ungovernable. ungovernable sorry, They seemed really revolutionary. Um, so this is an example of someone serving in MK. Uh, this is from the labor union, uh, the largest federation of labor unions. And what really happened uh, is that these guys, uh, it, it, it was a successful revolution, but it was initially hopeless on both sides. Um, the ANC wasn't strong enough to get the national, um, the, the, the national regime, the uh, national party to cave in. Um, and the National Party wasn't strong enough to actually govern the country with the ANC trying to put it into turmoil. Um, so they had to have a compromise solution. But again, if you look at the, at, the, uh, at the conditions that led to this revolution, peaceful revolution in this case, because the old regime stepped down, um, it was, you had relative deprivation. People couldn't live on the wages. You had huge poverty next to massive wealth. A small minority of the country um, was living... Um, like in, in Western Europe, but in this little tiny um, uh, island within South Africa. You had a, a charismatic leadership under Nelson Mandela. You had all the systemic conditions um, that, I, that I've been talking about. And this led to this revolution in South Africa. So next we're going to go on and we're going to talk about post-revolutionary violence. Take a little break here. So now, once we actually have a revolution, we can talk about post-revolutionary violence. Um, often this violence is, is well, this is, this is actually really interesting, because another important aspect of the non-democratic violent, violent revolutions, no, sorry, let me start again. Uh, another important aspect of the non-violent democratic revolutions is that you haven't had post-revolutionary violence. Okay. Even though they're doing many of the same things as other revolutions, transforming the system, the political, economic, and social system, but they take a different approach. But most violent revolutions will involve post-revolutionary violence in order to destroy the old, the old institutions, the old entrenched interests, and create some sort of fallow ground for the new ones to, 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 to blossom in. So often we're talking about a very bloody and destabilizing period after revolutions. So if you look at Russia's revolution in 1917, it was followed by civil war. More than 5 million people were killed. Many countries were drawn in, including the U.S. and the U.K., who supported the whites, that was uh, the name of the, um, those supporters of the old order, versus the reds, or the Communist Party. Um, often, this involves backtracking. Uh, the need uh, for this or that institution to consolidate power. So you promise to get rid of it later, but you rely on um, the, the old institutions in order to consolidate power. So it might, you might look like a hypocrite. So, for example, in the Soviet Union, the Communist Party called for the end of the state. Um, but the communists came to power and they actually strengthened the state in certain ways, certainly the coercive apparatus. Um, the state grew really in every way during the communist rule. Um, uh, the state controlled the entire economy. Uh, the state controlled everything. Um, this was supposed to be a transition period uh, in, you know, the Marxist uh, notion. Um, but you had lots of interests that maintained a strong state, right? You had patrimonial um, clientelistic networks that formed around this strong state, which made the strong state something that would never go away. Um, and you have similar stories in other revolutions from France to Iran, where they promised to disband certain institutions, and they actually manipulate them and use them for their own um, uh, for their own means, and often these are the coercive institutions that we're talking about that were so hated under the um, old regime. 
Uh, so post-revolutionary violence is a staple. We'll talk about it when we talk about the cases of France, Iran, um, Russia. Um, what else do we talk about that had a revolution? Um, so that's probably, that's probably it from that perspective. Um, so moving along, we're, we're now moving into another form of political violence, which is terrorism. Unlike revolution, which can take place through peaceful means, terrorism is always going to be linked to political violence. Uh, so terrorism is defined as the use of violence by non-state actors against civilians in order to achieve a political goal. Terrorism occurs when individuals or groups of individuals are unable to influence their adversaries through other means, like diplomacy, economic coercion, sabotage. Um, then they, uh, they, they become involved uh, in terrorism. Members of terrorist organizations are generally considered to be psychologically healthy. These aren't, these aren't crazies out there. They're considered rational actors for whom terrorism is a reasonably informed choice among available alternatives. Some, which, some of which have been tried unsuccessfully. This doesn't mean that the state is out of the picture. The state also can engage in terror. And we could talk about state terror. So there are a variety of means that we can um, talk about the state being involved in terror. Um, the most obvious is state terror, where you have an extraordinarily coercive repressive apparatus. Um, for example, Mao in China, Stalin in the Soviet Union, um, engaged in regular state terror. They used violence. Um, against civilians in order to achieve a political goal, um, terrorize the population. Uh, but you also have state-backed terror. When you think about the paramilitaries that roamed Latin America, um, these, these were organizations that were backed by the state, but they, they, they were den they, there was this plausible deniability. Well, it wasn't very plausible in the end. But there was this element of deniability where the state would say, we have nothing to do with this, even though everyone knows they did. Um, moving along, you also have state-sponsored terrorism. Um, so by state-sponsored terrorism, we're talking about the use of terrorist organizations by weak states as a proxy in, in, in their struggle against stronger states. Uh, so um, Syria and Iran's um, uh, support for Hezbollah um, in its fight against Israel uh, would be a case uh, in point. Um, and finally, we've got uh, state revolutionaries, revolutionaries who took over the state, who have also relied on terror either to consolidate, um, usually often to consolidate power. Uh, so think about Robespierre in France, for example. I just talked about the Russian and Soviet case. Terrorism and uh, guerrilla warfare are two different things. Unlike guerrillas um, or, or traditional warfare in general, um, those, those types tend to avoid civilians. Unlike those, terrorism... Um, is really targeted against what we call soft targets. So these are, these are civilians. Um, their targets are chosen for their emotional impact. Um, this, can be, this can mean that they go for symbolic attacks, such as 9-11. They went after our symbols of economic might, the, the World Trade Center. They went after our symbols of, of governance, the White House. They didn't get it. Uh, they went after the symbols of, of military power, the Pentagon. They did get um, but the tar targets can also be chosen um, really more indiscriminately. The whole point is to keep people on nerve. The, the broader point of terrorism is to erode people's faith in the state, to show that the state can't fulfill one of its chief obligations, which is to provide security. Um, so guerrillas and terrorists uh, may go after different things, but they both have political aims. But there's, again, there's another but here. Guerrillas see the state actors as legitimate. But they want to contest them. They want to contest them, so they often try, usually through peaceful means, and if that doesn't work, um, they, they engage in violence. Terrorists see the status quo leaders and the whole system as illegitimate. So whereas the guerrillas might accept the system, um, the terrorists don't accept the system. Uh, so if you think about MK, Mkonto Sees way that I just talked about, the ANC's armed wing, um, what are they? Were they a terrorist organization? Were they a guerrilla organization? Um, often, you know, this is, this is, this depends on, <laughs> it depends on, on which side you are on. If you like the, the ANC's MK, then you'd probably see them as a guerrilla organization, but they did occasionally have soft targets. Uh, were these accidents on overzealous few? There was one in Durban that killed a handful of civilians. They bombed a bar. Um, well, this is, this is clearly a, a soft target. So were they terrorists? Were they guerrillas? You know, your guerrillas are my terrorists. That's tough to say. Um, 
the goal of all terrorist organizations is to atomize society and create widespread disorientation towards the incumbent regime, something I alluded to a second ago. You can use discriminate and or indiscriminate attacks to generate high levels of anxiety, scare everybody, right? These are, these are high, popula high, high population targets. These are symbolic of everything we stand for. Or these are random. These are targets that are going, you know, the, the people are being targeted no matter where they are. No one is safe. So you're trying to disorient the populations. And another way you can do that is to provoke government repression, um, disproportional uh, government responses. So a domestic security clampdown, some sort of harsh retaliation by the government. Again, the point here is to show you that the government is no longer on your side, that the government is not on the good side. Um, now, in order to do this, terrorist organizations frequently have to engage in attacks that are more and more newsworthy, um, ever, more, ever more spectacular, something that will draw the attention of the news. Because it, as we're all familiar with, um, in the case of Iraq, we've seen over the years um, more and more terrorist attacks that have been ignored in the press, or people just sort of skim them over. How many times do you see another bombing in uh, a market in Baghdad, and you just kind of skim over and look for the next news story? So terrorists have to be uh, creative and engage in something that will be more newsworthy. And this brings us to a differentiation between traditional terrorist organizations and modern terrorist organizations. Traditionally, terrorist groups have been politically motivated, hierarchical, bureaucratic organizations. Their primary function is a narrow set of political goals. Charges against the legitimacy and authority, uh, or trying to gain, gain legitimacy and authority over a territory and, and push away um, the authorities who currently um, govern that territory. 1968 actually marks the first year of international terrorism. Uh, and at that point, eight out of 11 identifiable international terrorist organizations were after a Marxist-Leninist state. They were, after, they were communists. Um, three of them were nationalists. Okay? But they had a narrow set of political goals. They wanted communism, not a worldwide communist revolution, but, but first communism within their state borders. The others, they were nationalist. Um, so in a traditional terrorist organization, you have a core political elite. These guys up here. Uh, they're, the, they're the ones who are making executive decisions and subsequently passing them down. Um, so this brings us to the next state, uh, next uh, group here, um, which is the bureaucracy. These are organizations with political propaganda fundraising, paramilitary operations. Um, and this should read fundraising, not fundraising. <laughs> uh, so... Yes, so these are organizations um, that, are, that are complex organizations. They have various departments. Now, at the very bottom here, you've got the foot soldiers. These are the ones who go off and they blow up things. They can blow up themselves in the process, suicide bombers. So examples of, of uh, traditional terrorist organizations uh, include the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, that is, in Israel and Palestine, the Irish Republican Army, um, in Ireland, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC in uh, Colombia, the Basques ETA in Spain. So these are all examples of traditional terrorist organizations trying to attain control over a specific territory. Now, structures influence strategies, and this is very important. Um, and this is where we talk about primary versus secondary audiences. Pay attention, because this is key when we talk about modern terrorist organizations in a second. These leaders, these political elites are ambitious. They've got political goals. And what this means is they have to appeal to um, in, intra-organizational supporters, so those people here, um, who we can call their primary audience, as well as latent supporters, um, those people in society whose support they really need to actually ever get their, their uh, political goals achieved. And this is what we call the secondary audience. So the primary audience is the people... Uh, composed of the people within the organization. The secondary audience is composed of people who are latent supporters, potential supporters, people who might be sympathetic to them. Now think about what this means for a traditional terrorist organization. They're being pulled into two groups, uh, into two, into, in two ways. The political elites, on the one hand, have to appease these people. These people, um, their primary audience within their organizations, are the people who want high activity levels. They've gotten involved in this terrorist organization to, to do something, right? I mean, think about 
Uh, you hear about soldiers who who go off to went off to Iraq in in the uh, and I'm just saying this from personal experiences. A couple of friends, one of whom was a general, uh, one of whom is uh, I don't know whatever happened to him, but he was in military intelligence and so it doesn't matter. But the point is, these people, three people who went off to Iraq and uh, in 1991 was it the first Gulf War, and they found themselves sitting around, sitting around, sitting around. And they found it very frustrating because they were trained to go off and do something. And that doing something was fighting. Same thing with these terrorist organizations. People who get involved in them want to see action. They want to see that they're doing something. Okay? So this means that we should expect to find very bloody, um, a very bloody pattern. But the secondary audiences, the secondary audiences are people who don't want to see uh, an overly chaotic, overly bloodthirsty um, uh, presence. They don't want to find bombs going off every day. Um, this isn't something that makes them happy. And so these secondary audiences have a moderating effect. Um, and, and so the primary audience demands high levels of activity, blood. The secondary audience uh, demands much less of that and, and demands a stop to um, a lot of that. And so this has a moderating tendency on traditional terrorist organizations. And so what sorts of things do traditional terrorist organizations engage in? Um, usually they would bomb what we call hard targets, so police, military, um, posts, etc. Um, frequently they engage in hijackings, um, but not the 9-11 style attacks where they killed thousands of civilians. Um, they definitely didn't, in, wouldn't engage in things like biological warfare, chemical warf warfare, radiological warfare. Um, because these are the sorts of things that their secondary audiences wouldn't approve of. So let's uh, step forward to the changing nature of terrorism, to the modern terrorist organizations. And I'll tell you right now that this, is, uh, this picture here is, is, uh, is because I'm not very good at uh, the picture art in, uh, in, um, in PowerPoint. But what you should see are, oh, it disappeared, there it goes. There should be connections everywhere. Connections, these are all, each of these is called a node. So these are cells, terrorist cells, let's say. And each of these should be connected to each other, um, to one another. Um, and then they're also connected to some sort of center. But the point is that they have lots of, there, there is no one center, as it looks like in this particular picture, because there, we, we're drawing lines here and here and here and here, um, connecting them all to each other. So a, a terrorist, a modern terrorist organization um, generally has a broader supra-political ideology. This isn't just about um, may, taking control and changing the regime in a particular state or policies in a, in a particular state. Um, it's about something much broader. And these supra-political ideologies allow um, for this organization to decentralize. We're not talking about a specific political elite that wants to um, ultimately stay, stay at the helm in, in the hope of ultimately gain, gaining political positions. Okay? Um, but this also means is that you lack secondary audiences. Um, so these groups are really left to the whims of, 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 uh, of their radical primary audience, right? You don't have a secondary audience that you need if, if you're, you know, starting these organizations because really what you want to do is, is something that goes beyond the national borders. So you don't need to get elected or something. It'd be great if everyone supports you. Um, but really you're fighting for these amorphous ideas and you don't care and, 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 and the easiest way to do it is, is, to, uh, is, is to support your, your primary audience, right? Just, just engage in this, in this sort of violence. So the lack of secondary audiences um, means that, again, you're going to be more radical. Um, so we've got, for example, religious terrorist leaders that have very amorphous and very broad goals. Um, they, they, uh, they can choose to preach a more radical ideology, not, not caring about... Um, the broader secondary audience, which is probably going to be in a, any given society much more moderate. And this means essentially they can engage in much greater levels of violence without constraints. And so in the past 15 years, we've seen attacks involving traditional explosives, uh, but also chemical weapons like sarin, um, biological weapons like anthrax. Um, so far, we haven't seen uh, any nuclear weapons, but there's a lot of fear that we could find a dirty bomb very soon. Um, Dirty bombs, again, not really having a significant physical impact on people, but having a major psychological impact on people. People freak out and they think something bad's happening to them. Um, in reality, uh, these actually aren't a huge uh, deal for your, for your body.
Um, perhaps unless you're standing right in front of it when it blows up. So there are lots of tactical benefits to uh, these modern terrorist networks. You don't have this hierarchy. Um, you've got these, what we call network structures. Again, um, you can draw the little lines on your own slide, um, which allows terrorist organizations to um, increase their use of violence and also assume greater degrees of cooperation with organizations that would otherwise be considered rivals in a nationalist-oriented struggle. Um, so uh, we wouldn't ally with this other cell over here uh, because that other cell is composed of, in a traditional, in, with traditional organizations, these are rivals. These are people who also want the political spots um, when we get regime change. Here, these broad amorphous goals, it doesn't matter. We all just want to work together to get whatever we're trying to get. Um, so another advantage is that you can use network tactics. You can swarm your target from various directions in a highly coordinated and covert manner and then disappear in different directions and meld back into society. It's very hard to find these people. They don't have um, bureaus and departments um, and, a, and a hierarchy that you can trace. And, uh, and finally, they're acephalous. In other, in other words, they don't have a primary leader, which is why this is uh, a, a horrible picture. I apologize. Um, so if they do have a primary leader, you can, you can kill them, you can capture them and decrease the group's viability. But with modern terrorist organizations, it's very difficult to decapitate them. So yeah, we got bin Laden, but has that stopped Al-Qaeda? Well, probably not. Although we were actually surprised by the degree to which Al-Qaeda, um, uh, uh, bin Laden still had a, a strong role in Al-Qaeda. So that was, that was uh, interesting. And, and it's, it's, you know, the problem of doing research on, uh, on non-transparent regimes and non-transparent actors is that you're going to find some of these um, uh, surprises and then you're going to have to adapt uh, the arguments and think a little bit more and get a better idea of how it works. Um, so that may be uh, changing a little bit of this, but clearly Al-Qaeda still functions. Al-Qaeda in various areas, these various cells still function um, no matter how uh, in tune bin Laden was. And there's also evidence that bin Laden was actually being ignored um, in many cases. Uh, so all these are, are examples for why uh, modern terrorist organizations um, are more violent and in several ways advantaged. Um, now, I might as well go here. Um, religion has played an important role in many of these because when we talk about a super political ideology, well, religion's a great one. Um, and it's not just uh, Islamic radicalism. We could talk about various uh, religious radical groups. So going back to our definitions, fundamentalists are those who want to in, in, enact a religious order, but they tend to believe that this can be done peacefully and democratically. They turn violent, though, where they're combined with some sort of hostility to modernity, especially where modern institutions are divorced from traditional ones, they're dropped down on them, they're seen as illegitimate. Also, when, uh, when the struggle is seen in very stark terms, good versus evil, um, this lends to, lends to a dehumanization of anyone who's affiliated with the status quo, with the current order. Um, so these groups tend to be cloaked in conspiracy theories. Uh, they make all soft targets fair game because anyone who's a voter, who's a citizen, um, is politically guilty. They're somehow, uh, in, if they're not against the state, then they're somehow supporting it, whether actively or passively. Um, and and so, so soft targets are very easy to go after. Um, these organization, organizations can often be motivated by apocalyptic religious notions. So the world is going to end and therefore we should um, do something about it. So Timothy McVeigh, for example, the one who engineered and uh, implemented the bombings in Oklahoma in 1995, he was a follow, follower of a guy named William Pierce, who was the leader of this white separatist national alliance. Um, these guys founded their own religion called Cosmotheism. Uh, where they had a hierarchical society governed by what um, Pierce saw as the essential principles of nature, including survival of the fittest. So really, this was a fascist, um, fascist religious sort of organization that Timothy McVeigh followed. Uh, and so, uh, so everyone, soft targets were all over the place, and they were fair game. And again, there was no secondary audience that Timothy McVeigh was trying to, um, was trying to uh, uh, win over. Uh, another case, Aum Shinrikyo, uh, this organization was, or terrorist group was founded in 1984, translates to supreme truth. It was founded by a guy named Shoko Asahara in his Tokyo apartment. And initially, it mostly centered around yoga and meditation. Um, they heavily recruited people from uh, the university, so university students, graduates. Um, 
their initiations were kind of, well, I don't want to be judgmental, but they involved sort of off things like uh, hallucinogens and uh, various religious practices that were supposedly, uh, that supposedly involved uh, like stretching yoga out to include hanging people upside down, shocking them. So they were a little bit off. Um, now, the followers were convinced that the world was going to end. And they were convinced that they should participate in its end through whatever means possible. Chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, whatever. Because all, everyone who would go with uh, Shoko Asahara in these attacks would survive. And those who would go against him would deserve death. They would die and it would be awful. So in 1995, the same year as the Oklahoma bombings uh, in Tokyo, um, you had uh, sarin attacks. So luckily this was an impure version of this nerve agent. But uh, followers of Aum Shinrikyo um, attacked five trains in the Tokyo subway system, uh, killing 13 commuters and seriously injuring 54, but affecting, this is key, affecting up to 5,000. They created massive panic. So what Sarin does is it induces chest tightness, difficulty breathing, nausea, drooling. Um, you lose your bodily functions. You twitch. You convulse. You go into a coma, and then you just suffocate. Um, but again, very few people actually suffered this fate, but it was an effective terrorist attack because it scared so many people. Um, you, you, they, they overran the state institutions, i.e. hospitals. Um, the, 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 the emergency services couldn't deal with this number of people. There were psychological effects. Um, it, it shook people and it made them feel like the state wasn't able to protect them. The police actually raided this, this, uh, this, the cult's headquarters and reportedly found a large number of things, um, explosives, chemical weapons, biological warfare agents, um, such as anthrax and Ebola cultures. Um, they also found a Russian military helicopter. Um, I don't know how they got that in there, apparently in pieces. Anyway, all this highlights the question of rationality. Are these rational actors? Well, they are for what they're trying to do, right? If, if you want to survive the apocalypse, well, then you engage in these things. But religion really blurs the lines of what is rational. Um, so why do we have terrorism? Well, we can go back to the frameworks that I put um, up earlier uh, in this lesson, and we can, we can apply these. So some of the causes, uh, let's talk about institutional causes. Think about economic inequality, marginalization. Um, this is something that certainly many of the rank and file join for, not the leaders. The leaders tend to be more educated and, um, and not marginalized, actually. So a lack of education would be another one. Um, but again, maybe for the rank and file, but not for the leaders who tend to be better off. Um, closed political institutions. And you, you have a, a pretty decent correlation. Um, in authoritarian states, you've got the motivation, right, because you're closed out. Um, in illiberal states, you've got the motivation and you've got the opportunity, since the state is generally seen as weaker than in authoritarian states. Um, so, uh, in terms of in terms of domestic terrorism, okay, and this is this is really what we're talking about um, at this point. Well, we could talk about both, but certainly um, from this perspective, it, it relates better to traditional terrorists um, because of all the reasons that we talked about how modern terrorist organizations have different goals. So, if we're talking about these traditional terrorist organizations, I mean, a remedy might be to give them a stake in the system. Um, although, actually, in the case of Aum Shinriko, they tried to give them. Um, a stake in this. They, these guys tried democracy first, but all their candidates were defeated in parliamentary elections. Um, what all this means is that democratization can actually bring more danger if you have weaker and less stable um, states. So totalitarian states uh, might be better off when it comes to terrorism, completely block the terrorists out, make it impossible for them to act. Look at North Korea, uh, for example. You don't see um, terrorist attacks in North Korea. Um, a second set of causes can be ideational. Um, this, these don't necessarily address why they fight, but they address why they're open to particular tactics. Uh, for example, nihilism. All status quo institutions are worthless. Um, they have to be destroyed to start anew. Right? Destroy everything old, destroy all the people who support them, and then start anew. This new order. Um, and finally, we can have lots of individual um, aspects to this. I mean, there's humility. Um, look at Israel and the relationship with Palestine. We can talk about humility. Um, identity, solidarity, um, we could talk about religious beliefs, all these things which can, which can prompt people to join these organizations. Uh, so that's, that's uh, 
that's everything for this lesson. So we'll stop there. That was really long.